So these are two of my friends, uh, Jack Heater and Andrew. I'm going to let them first introduce themselves. You start, Jack. Uh, I'm a friend of Martine. I don't drink, though. And um, I, I've been an entrepreneur. Uh, I started as a neuroscientist uh, studying the brain, and then I became an entrepreneur starting tech companies. My first company is Dice, Dice.com. Uh, people may know Dice. It's the largest tech job board in America. And then I went on to become uh, an entrepreneur again and again. And now instead of being a serial entrepreneur, I'm a parallel entrepreneur because I can't stop myself. So I start a few things at the same time. Uh, I'm Andrew McLaughlin. Um, I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Betaworks. Um, before that, from last year till the summer, uh, I was at Tumblr. Before that, two years in the White House, six years at Google before that. And uh, my first entrepreneurial thing was uh, launching something called ICANN, which is the technical coordinating organization for the internet. A very weird startup, but a startup nonetheless. Great. Uh, well, what I wanted to do to, to start the conversation before we get into the topic, uh, which is how sort of how startups deal with the, the elephants or the large companies, the Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft uh, types of the world, uh, I thought it would be an opportunity since the election just happened. And as you said, Andrew, you were in the, in the White House uh, as the deputy CTO of this country. I, I think maybe you, you would like um, both of you uh, to give me an analysis of the result of the election, but focus on entrepreneurship. Do you think uh, Obama was the best candidate for entrepreneurship? And what do you think is going to happen to the environment of entrepreneurship in this country in the next four years? So, um, so you know, my bias up front is that I'm an Obama supporter. I'm delighted at the election results um, for many reasons. But, but to try to give as honest an answer as I can, um, I actually do think that uh, what... Barack Obama has been trying to do uh, is uh, very useful for startups. Um, in the case of uh, tech startups in particular, there are a couple of big issues that he's now much better positioned than Mitt Romney would have been uh, to make progress. One is immigration. Um, the tech industry is starved for talent. Um, and uh, in a global uh, marketplace for labor and for capital, the more labor and skilled labor and the more capital that we can get into the country, the better off we are as a country, and I think um, the president, uh, because of the nature of his support from communities that have strong feelings about immigration, um, uh, the Asian American community, um, the uh, Indian American community, Hispanic Americans, and so forth, um, he will be in a much stronger political position to make progress on that. Plus, by the way, Silicon Valley as an industry was his single biggest backer financially. Um, so uh, he's got a lot of incentives to try to do something good in that area. Second issue is um, related to the talent problem, which is uh, uh, domestically improving education uh, in science, engineering, math, uh, and so forth. And I think he's been very good on that, that issue. And I think as president, he will be a ton better than Mitt Romney would have been um, at uh, uh, getting more um, resources, commitment, um, and improved standards uh, in those areas. Then the third thing I'll say is that, um, broadly speaking, government has been a terrible customer for entrepreneurs. Um, government spends a lot of money, but it's almost impossible for startups to ever uh, have the government as a client. And I, uh, this is an area um, very boring, extremely dull, around procurement, contracting, and the openness of those processes, where he's hired some very good people that are very committed to that, and it has been um, a four-year struggle that I've watched, been a part of, and then watched to see some progress in that area get made. And I think the next four years we'll see a significant acceleration in results um, so that it's easier for a startup to um, uh, bid, know about the opportunities to have a government client, and then uh, get paid. And uh, just one more question, Andrew. And then I, I, do you think, I've been reading, uh, of course, the election was very close. There were a few million votes one way or the other in a country of 370 million people. And there's been many reports that I read that one of the main reasons uh, why the president won is that is the Latino vote, let's say the Hispanic vote, and the policies of Romney on immigration. And uh, do you agree with that? I actually don't. Um, so what's interesting is if you look at the exit polling data about Hispanic Americans, they are just politically closer to Democrats than they are to Republicans. Immigration is one issue, but you look at the whole list of issues that they care about, and Latinos tend to favor a more active government that provides a stronger social safety net. So actually, 
ideologically, Hispanics are closer to the Democratic Party. And Republicans for a long time have had this view, and there's some truth to it, that Hispanics are to the right of most Americans on family-related issues, abortion, they tend to be uh, strong Catholics, um, uh, same-sex marriage, and so forth. And that's true. Hispanics are uh, more conservative on those issues. But what matters right now in that community is the high unemployment rate. They feel the consequences of unemployment benefits running out. They, they have a higher unemployment rate among young people. And they care more about an active government role in building a social safety net. By the way, for entrepreneurs in this country, that, I think, uh, the, the, the achievement of affordable national health insurance for everybody is going to prove, prove to be one of the most important factors de-risking entrepreneurial activity so that you have less to lose if your startup fails because you'll know that your family can still uh, you know, afford uh, medications and your children can see the doctor uh, if it fails. And I think that is going to, by the way, prove to be one of the most important pro-entrepreneurial uh, policy outcomes, which is that as of this election, affordable national health insurance for every American is irreversible. Just like Social Security was, uh, 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 and Medicaid, Medicare, or, or medical coverage for elderly people, um, if Barack Obama had lost this election, it would be dead. Having won it, I think it'll now get implemented and it will become irreversible, and that'll be super important. Well, first I would say, has everyone seen the video of the Al Smith dinner? The Al Smith dinner is a dinner that happens uh, every year, but particularly in election years, it's very, very important because it's a dinner where both the presidential candidates come and they give funny comments instead of very serious comments at the debate. And one of the things that Barack Obama said uh, to Mitt Romney at that dinner was, uh, Mitt, your name Mitt is actually your middle name. And it's great that you can use your middle name. Myself, I cannot use my middle name. And so the, when you look at the Al Smith dinner, I think what's interesting is you can see that there's an aspect of our political system um, where it's a very, very tough, tough fight, but there's also a sense that, um, that the individuals involved realize that some things are beyond their control to some extent. In terms of the question you asked about th this particular election and entrepreneurship, First, I would say, going back to what you said about the team, Martin, you said, talked about the team that you build at phone, at places like that. This is a huge opportunity for Barack Obama. When you first get elected as president, you really have to put a lot of people in place that help you become president, right? So a lot of people involved in the campaign, a lot of people who raise money, things like that. You have to get them positions inside the government. And very often those people are competent, and sometimes they're Thank more you. competent people than those people. I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> And so we had a first term where we had a lot of really great people. Andrew was there, as an example. Uh, and there are two or three other examples. But uh, no, there are many, many examples of great people in the first term. But the fact is that when you look in terms of the business acumen and the experience and the entrepreneurial experience and the venture capital experience and the angel investing experience and the Fortune 500 experience of the people in the first term, it was not as strong as it could be. And so I actually, I'm very excited at this moment in time that the second term could have more of these kinds of people. That we have an opening right now at the Secretary of Commerce position. It's vacant. We have a new Secretary of Treasury who will be announced in the next three, four, or five months. We have positions at the um, uh, Department of Energy probably will become vacant. Steve Chu probably will move on. And that's a very, very key business kind of position and many positions below that. And when you ask people in the venture community, yes, Obama was very, very close and came many times to Silicon Valley and here in New York, we met with him and so on and so forth, and that's great. But there were not enough people inside the administration, in my opinion, who could really carry that message forward and implement the policy. Inside OSTP, Office of Science Tech Policy, where Andrew was, fantastic. They were doing challenge prizes and X prizes and unbelievable things. But outside of that, of that area, I think we could do more. And I think now is the moment when we've gone through the first term, many of these people will move on, we can start with a new thing. The only other thing I would say is the number three million. Right now with, if you look at seven and a half percent unemployment, but the real number is probably more in the 14, 15, 16% range if you add in all the people who have given up or on other kinds of insurances and things like that. That's a lot of people out of work. Yet, at this moment, there are three million jobs going begging. There are three million open jobs right now. 
if you go on the job boards, if you add all the job boards up in terms of what the jobs available are, three million jobs. So there's a mismatch. It goes back to what Andrew said about education. What could we do more in these four years now that is, yes, broad long term, but also very more specific in terms of right now getting the kind of people who can fill those three million jobs? And we have a mismatch right now. So I think those are two things I would be optimistic right this minute, having had the election just a few days ago, that we can do more progress on in terms of people in the administration, like ourselves, like people in this room right now. And by the way, you do not have to be a U.S. citizen for many of these jobs. So if people here are not from the U.S., and they're not, not U.S. citizens today, you can still take many of these jobs. Number two, let's focus on this job skill gap. How do we close it more quickly? And uh, having moved from building companies in Europe to building companies in America, which uh, that's kind of how I started, I see two, two elements of my costs that are in, insanely high in America compared to uh, the rest of the world, really compared to Asia, Europe, Latin America, and so on. And they're mainly the legal costs of doing business and the healthcare costs of doing business if you want to provide medical insurance for your employees. Um, for example, in Europe, you pay 30% more than the salary of the employee in social charges, and in America, you only pay 8%. But when you add the cost of uh, for example, healthcare at five hundred to a thousand dollars an employee, which you want to provide to employees. When you add, you, and when you ask the, when you add the legal costs of, I mean, I've taken companies public in America. The legal bills are like ten million, five million, two million. I mean, I, it is, it is shocking, right? And and so, but, uh, what do you think, American entrepreneurs, if the, if it was up to them, what do you think uh, are the things they would like to see improved or changed? My view. Of course, is with these two. There's all of, a lot of things that are phenomenal about em employment here. I love the way in America you can uh, more or less hire and fire at will with some. But a, a startup is a company. A startup is about trial and error. You're you're hiring. You're trying people. Uh, Europe, in fact, educated me because it's so expensive to fire people. It really made me a good person at hiring people because you have to. Uh, you have to be excellent, but here you can try them out on the job, and I still think this is a better system. So, so all that side I think is phenomenal in the states, but I see other taxes that are particularly uh, high. What, what do you guys think? Go first. Um, in terms of what entrepreneurs want, well, one thing that Barack Obama said in his first campaign that I supported very, very much is he said that he was going to take a period of time and lower the capital gains tax for anyone who made an investment in a startup. So in America, we have capital gains on two kinds of things, investments in startups and growth capital, and on dividends of getting stocks. So he would not touch the capital gains on dividends, because that really doesn't create value in, in America. It doesn't create more jobs. It just creates value for the wealthy people, typically, or pension funds who, who get, that, that get that dividend. But in terms of capital gains on investment in a company, I really would hope that the administration comes back to that point and does find a way to have a focus on that particular. And in the grand bargain that's about to happen, hopefully in the next six, 12 months between Democrats and Republicans, this is an area that they can find common ground on. This is an area where Republicans who are very pro-business, you heard Mitt Romney again and again talk about pro-business, pro-business. Well, if you wanna be pro-business, you should be pro-entrepreneur. And to be pro-entrepreneur, we wanna be pro-investment in startups. Until today, right now, we still don't have, yes, there's a lot of venture capital, yes, there are good venture capital firms, yes, there's more angel investing, but there's still more entrepreneurs out there who cannot connect with that particular kind of money. And so we want that to happen, not just in New York, and not just in Silicon Valley, not just in Austin, Texas, but in places around, around the country. There's a great startup, nonprofit, called Venture for America. Just like Teach for America, Venture for America. And Venture for America says, Let's have startups and investment and angel investing in small towns in America, not just in the big centers. And so I think that if the president can really focus on these kinds of policies that encourage investment in young startups, that would be a, one, a great win for entrepreneurs right now. So let me say um, a word about the legal costs side of this. So our, our legal system is... Um, Miraculous in some ways and a catastrophe in other ways. The mirac miraculous part of it is that it provides a very um, uh, 
solid foundation for the country. Like we have judges that are independent, largely, and um, uh, a legal system that is, while expensive, relatively predictable. The, um, the problem, though, is that if you're a startup, you're spending money um, on compliance. Um, and that's particularly true in a country that's got 50 states and a division of responsibilities on things like taxation, employment regulation, um, and, uh, and so forth, um, between the federal government and the state governments. And for a lot of startups that have virtual employees, um, in uh, you know uh, ten different states, like a, a couple of the online news publications that uh, you guys are reading, have got writers distributed all over the place. And when they make them employees, you suddenly have to worry about complying with the employment laws everywhere. It's a real headache. Um, uh, in that sense, we don't even have a common market uh, uh, in, in that's as robust in some ways as the European Union is building. Um, but anyway, but that's a problem. Uh, uh, if you're an e-commerce company, Lord help you, you have to come up with sales tax compliance in every state where you're doing transactions. There are companies that will help you with this, but you're going to pay for it. Um, the other is litigation. So on the first one, actually, there's a lot of talk about tax harmonization, especially sales tax, because right now states uh, are not collecting sales taxes where the customers are in their state, but the seller is somewhere else. So they feel like if you go and buy this at Walmart, I can tax it and make money for the state. If you buy it from Amazon, I don't. And I think that pressure will cause some harmonization, which could be a good thing, and I think the administration will be strong in that. The um, other thing, though, is, is for tech companies, anyway, that the patent system has become this incredible uh, 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 risk factor, uh, source of uncertainty, cost item, and uh, distortion to the marketplace. Um, and I kind of am depressed about this, because we went through a big patent reform process that in some ways actually made our system worse. Um, it improved a few things, made some other things worse. It still is the case that um, if you're an entrepreneur, and this flows into the topic of the panel, how you deal with um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so forth, um, who have huge patent portfolios and, uh, uh, and whose traditional cultural view that we only use them defensively and not offensively is now changing, I think, in an alarming way. Uh, where these big uh, former insurgents are now incumbents and are looking increasingly like uh, the patent trolls that they used to denounce. Um, anyway, so the patent system uh, is a huge problem. And um, uh, uh, I don't see much way, uh, I don't see much reason to think that the law is going to change. Um, it's very hard to get a patent reform bill through, and everybody's exhausted from the last one, even though it sucked. Um, and then. Uh, uh, I don't see much room, way to innovate around it. People have tried to come up with patent pools and uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, licensing arrangements where you can buy into uh, cross-licensed patents as a group. And I, I don't, they don't seem to be taking off. They seem to be acting more like patent trolls themselves, uh, those, those efforts. So that's an, an area to kind of be depressed about, I think. Okay, so to change the tone now, but because we know what's we, we've gone for what's what's wrong with America now. Obviously, there's a lot that is right with America because America has come up with with Google and Apple and Facebook and Microsoft, and it was interesting. I was reading that in the last uh, 40 years, uh, of the most valuable companies in the world, Europe came up with one, which is Inditex, uh, which is. By the way, as an aside, it's very interesting that the, out of the three richest people in the world, two of them made their fortunes in Spanish, Carlos Slim and Amancio Ortega, who's now wealthier than Warren Buffett. The three wealthiest people in the world are Carlos Slim, then Bill Gates, then Amancio Ortega, right? Who's worth 53 billion and built this company in Spain. I think Bill Gates is now learning Spanish. That, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, so the, it's probably true. So the, the, the question is, so, but, but this is like one company, yeah, on Khan Academy. Well, this is one company, one company out of the whole continent of Europe, okay? Europe, which still has the highest GDP in the world. And yet America is so amazing, amazing at building the most interesting, fascinating, valuable companies in the world. So what is so right that this can happen? And what, what, what do you think other parts of the world could, could emulate or copy about what's great in America? Well, so, um, so when I was at Google and then when I was in the White House, um, I was constantly be meeting with delegations from different countries that were coming to ask this question, right? How do we make Silicon Valley in Santiago? How do we make a Silicon Valley in Sao Paulo? How do we make a Silicon Valley in Madrid and so forth? Um, and so 
in one sense, that's totally the wrong question to be asking, right? Because Silicon Valley, uh, the Bay Area of California, is completely unique in the world. It's unique in this country. We haven't been able to replicate it in Boston. We haven't really been able to replicate it in New York. We haven't been able to replicate it in uh, Chicago. It is a really unique thing. It's got universities that feed talent. It's got um, people that have made a ton of money and put it back into the ecosystem, even though, by the way, it's kind of economically irrational. This is one of the weirdest things about Silicon Valley. Is like, if you make a ton of money and have a huge exit uh, from a Silicon Valley startup, part of your job is to then become an investor. Even though if you look at it irrationally, you should probably just give your money to Goldman Sachs because you'll make a better return over the next 20 years. But they do. It's seen as part of what you do. And when I look at Europe, actually, that's one of the big failings, I think, of a lot of entrepreneurs. You're not one of them, but, but many of your counterparts have a big exit and they just take their money off the table. Um, and they don't pump it back into those ecosystems. Anyway, so there's these unique features about it. But one question is, you know, so what can you learn from the U.S.? Um, and uh, 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 um, I think one obvious lesson, which has some policy implications and some cultural implications, is that the most important thing in getting uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem up and running and healthy is the earliest, most uh, risk-friendly capital, right? So it's that first $100,000, that first $200,000 that is the hardest for a Kenyan entrepreneur or a Brazilian entrepreneur to get their hands on. Um, banks, and if your country's um, investors are primarily institutions, they're very risk averse in general and they don't have a culture of taking risks. If it's wealthy individuals, um, then uh, maybe they might be more willing to take risks, but it's much harder to predict. And what we've got now in Silicon Valley is a predictable system of super angels and angels and early stage funds and so forth. And you know who to go talk to because they're in the business of hearing pitches, looking at deal flow, and making investments. So to me, the single most important thing um, about our ecosystem is that that um, angel and seed round, super risk friendly, early stage capital. Along with that comes the kind of like coaching and mentorship and lore and the existence of accountants and office space and all these other things. That tends to be where governments put their focus. Like, can we have a building with free internet and cheap desks or something like that? That's useful. I'm not a huge fan of those kinds of efforts because they're so much less important than that, um, that, that capital. Without that capital, nobody's going to be able to move in there, hire people, get the business off the ground. Martina, well, I would say... First off, there's really two kinds of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial sectors in America. And I think we sometimes only focus on one and not the other. There's the first that really is the, the folks in this room and, and, and the kind of things that, that many of us do, uh, mobile startups, tech startups, digital startups, uh, making crucial, crucial software, apps that manage your pet food, you know, things like this, you know, just things that are critical for society at all times. Um, but there's also another entrepreneurial class in America, which is, I think, equally important and also equally absent in many other countries. These are startups you don't read about. These are startups that are not going to be in tech crunch. These are startups that are not going to be in, in these kinds of, of uh, settings. And these are folks who are starting companies, um, delivery companies, courier companies, dry cleaners, so on and so forth. And the fact is, you have a lot of these startups I was involved for quite a number of years in microfinance, not the kind of microfinance you might imagine in Bangladesh and places like that, I did that too. But right here in America, where we said, let's take a pot of money and let's get loans and startup money to people who have business plans that would never reach Kleiner Perkins. Not because it's not a great idea, because that's not the kind of business that's venture backed. And so there's, uh, there's literally millions and millions and they're part of the driver of how we create jobs in America. And when you go to lots of other countries, this whole class of people is missing. It's just missing. You have people who handed down businesses like wineries and things like that from generation to generation, but you don't have as many of these other kinds of startups. So one, when we look at this picture, let's also include these kinds of um, policies and encouragement of those kinds of folks. And then when we come to the digital type of startups, the kind of type of startups that we do read about in TechCrunch, you know, my 12-year-old nephew came to me. His name is David. He said, Uncle Jack, I have an idea for a startup. He was absolutely serious. He is serious. We went on Alibaba. We wanted to find out if anyone out there makes this kind of product. It's an add-on to your iPhone. You attach it to your iPhone. It's a great idea, by the way. And we found that there's someone in China who manufactures something like this. Um, we emailed that person, and now we're getting new samples from 
Alibaba, you know, through Alibaba in China for a 12-year-old to start his company. Because, not because he read the Steve Jobs biography, no, he did, he's the last not person who did not read the biography, but he is aware of the general culture. He sees his uncle, he sees people around him starting businesses. And I think that that cultural aspect is so, so critical and um, it's permitted and allowed and encouraged now because of the internet. So I think that the internet has allowed my 12-year-old nephew to think about things. I, I had some entrepreneurial ideas when I was 12, but I didn't have as many sophisticated ideas as he had, as he has now, because he has access to the net. So I think access to the net has really changed the youth. You know, you look at Peter Thiel's program of, of 20 under 20 and things like that, and all these programs that are even going younger and younger and younger, that to me I think is very positive, that the internet has now brought in a new playing field of, of talent into the entrepreneurial pool. But here's the reality. The reality is it's not an 80-20 rule in America. It's a 298 rule. 2% 2 of Americans are creating all the innovation for 98%. So yes, it is true that America as a country is responsible for all these great companies. But if you look at the number of entrepreneurs, it's a very, still very, very, and in my opinion, it's too small. It's too homogenous. We don't have enough diversity, enough women. Fewer than 6% of all the venture-backed companies in America today are run and founded by women. That's not because women don't have the ideas. They have the ideas, but they're not enfranchised in the system that the men are. So I still think, yes, we have a very positive system, but yet if you actually drill into the details, actually it's a very fragmented situation of a very few creating innovation for very many, and those few do not net include the kinds of, all the kinds of folks I think we should include. Um, okay, as the last question before we open up for questions. Um, so America can make some of the most amazing corporations in the world, and yet there is room for the Instagram to grow against the Facebook, or the there, there's there's always room for the little guy, and and uh, and there is no matter even with the patents, even with everything that's going on, uh, what is what is the magic formula that allows? Because I'm I'm saying this because in many other countries, for example, you get a Carlos Slim and just nobody can compete against him, right? And, and you, so you say, wh why is it that, um, I mean, some of the reasons why I was saying Carlos Lima, and Mancio Ortega is because these people take over, like the way Amancio Ortega has taken over fashion, the way Carlos Slim has taken over telecommunications. Um, I believe, by the way, Amancio Ortega has done it in a, in a more transparent way. But, but having said this, they don't leave room for anyone else. How come in America there's always room for someone else to come up with something, how is it possible to compete with Facebook, to compete with Apple, to compete with Google, and, and uh, which was actually the original question for this panel? <laughs> well, <laughs> we get to eventually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so look, uh, um, there's a, there's a, um, it, you actually did a blog post about this one time, which I thought was really interesting, where you said, um, it says something very bad about Mexico which is a relatively poor country, that the world's richest man comes from Mexico. Um, and uh, in the case of Zara uh, and Inditex, it's a, I think a very different situation, actually. Um, but uh, anyway, so one answer is that we've got antitrust and competition laws, and you know, we broke up AT&T, and the government sued Microsoft, and that you know, we do occasionally do legal things. But, I actually think in some ways the European Union is doing a better job of that, uh, or certainly a more aggressive job. Actually, I think their remedies are kind of stupid, but you know, they just sued Microsoft for like having inadequate you know, pop-up option windows on, who cares? Um, uh, you know, Firefox was dramatically, so this is a great lesson actually. So Firefox did what the European Commission could not, like, and then the US uh, uh, Justice Department. Like, they went after Microsoft to try to break up the tying of browsers into the operating system and the crushing of Netscape and the competition. But then Firefox came along and just built a better product. It's just better, dramatically better. And, um, uh, and then Chrome came along and, um, and it was dramatically better, in my view, than, than Firefox. So um, anyway, but so that's the legal answer, right? I don't think that that's really what matters. What really matters is that Americans are genuinely, um, culturally populist and dislike big. We have big, we have like big banks, we have uh, uh, big automakers and so forth. But as a country, we are notoriously um, uh, 
culturally pro the little guy, pro the risk taker, pro the upstart. Um, we like to have the newest app on our phones. We like to have the newest thing on our, um, uh, uh, you know, the newest device uh, on our uh, desks. And that culture thing is the thing that's so hard to replicate. But because, um, uh, you know, for example, there's a big battle going on right now. Uh, it's a decade-long battle that we're still in the middle of between the people who own the physical infrastructure of the internet and the application companies that live on top of it. This is sometimes called the net neutrality battle. But anyway, it basically says, if you're AT&T, how much control should you have over the things that flow over your pipes? And uh, uh, it would be terrible for the innovation at the application layer if the infrastructure companies can control it, if you need their permission to get out there. Um, and it's one of the things that, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm now in a position where at Betaworks we have um, uh, a number of companies that are trying to get apps out there through the Apple ecosystem. And it's amazing to see how painful and slow uh, it makes your startup to have to wait a week to fix bugs. You know, like, that's terrible. And that's one of the reasons that I think that ecosystem is, uh, uh, is problematic. But anyway, um, uh, uh, asking Apple for permission to innovate is uh, an example of, of sort of the, the kind of thing that this country has genuine, generally rejected over time and moved towards more open markets and open systems. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, leaving aside all the legal stuff, it's, uh, it's a, a little bit of a... a, of a um, a kind of a hard answer to export to another country because it really is a cultural thing. I would just say, in a theater, the reason why a play could be successful is that each person knows their role in the play, right? So they go on stage, they do their role. Um, you know, I play Hamlet, you play the other role, you know, and we, we play on stage, it's successful. And picking up on one of Andrew's points, I think we in America have something very successful along those lines. Companies, when they start up, and as they grow, they kind of get a sense of what their role is going to be. Are they being a platform or are they going to be on a platform? And just as one example, there's other roles that people can play as well. So, for example, when people violate that, there's big uproar. So when Twitter, who eventually became to be seen as a platform that you can build stuff on, when they bought TweetDeck and then shut out all the other Twitter clients, it was seen as a violation of that role playing. That is... You created Twitter, fantastic, it's super popular, and then all these different people, Seismic and TweetDeck and so on and so forth, they created clients for you, for your platform, to add value to your platform, and then you bought some of them and then you rejected the others. And that was seen as a violation, whereas other platforms, like the Android system so on and so forth, and the Apple system when it started, and I agree now with Andrew that it's become quite, quite slow now, but these systems, these ecosystems, they allow so many more startups to start. So when you have a platform company that takes hold, then you can create uh, you know, a million new startups on top of that one. And we don't really see that sometimes in other countries. Each little startup sees itself as its own little island and not really part of a larger system of platform feature, platform feature, platform feature. And those platforms could be software platforms or when you have the, quote, overbuilding of fiber back in the 90s. Remember all the billions of dollars that were spent overbuilding the internet infrastructure and the routers and the fiber and so on and so forth? Well, it turns out we needed that because when YouTube hit and all the video hit, we needed to access all that dark fiber. And now that dark fiber is lit up. And when you had, and by the way, we haven't stopped this. When we went from a dial-up network to an always-on network, yes, many, many new companies came onto that platform. But we have not, we're going to look back 20 years from now and look at today's internet as flat, not dynamic, really, really boring. And we're going to be looking back 20 years from now and saying, ah, they didn't realize another layer of the platform was about to be built. So this kind of pylon, kind of like in archaeology where you go deep into the ground, you see layers and layers of civilizations, you can look at layers and layers of platform features, platform features, platform features, going back now 20 years from from CERN, from 1991, when Tim Berners-Lee created the web. That was really a platform. That platform was built on TCP IP, which a platform was built by ARPANET, so on and so forth. So we have a continual line of this thing, and this has been a very successful, virtuous circle that we've really fed ourselves into, and I think that's part of the success here. Well, thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, First of all, let me confess to being largely... Say your name. Oh, I'm Casey. Uh, I'm from uh, Block. Um, I, I have to confess to being uh, Apple illiterate uh, largely. I'm more of a, like a Unix uh, uh, 
Android type of guy. Um, my question pertains to the to the uh, Apple Marketplace, though, which is I, I know that there's a, that there's or at least I've read and, and you guys have uh, have confirmed this that there's a delay in getting the um, in getting apps out. But I've also heard, and I wanted to get your feedback on this, that there are cases where Apple basically says, this is not in our best interest, this is competing directly with us, or we just don't like it, so we're going to keep this out of our ecosystem. So my question is, is uh, have you seen that? Uh, do you have any comments on it? So there is some evidence that that, that, that has happened. Um, there are well-blogged cases where people have been rejected from the Apple App Store, and it seems that it's not a security-related re uh, reason um, but rather a competitive reason. Um, one great example is, uh, you know, there's still uh, no Google, app, uh, Google Maps app for uh, Apple. Apple says, well, Maps is like a thing that we're going to provide as a commodity service to everybody through our own uh, application, and um, they paid the price for that, by the way. But that was an example where I think a competitive reason might have been at the heart of it, not a user experience reason. Anyway, as long as there's a vigorous Android app marketplace, a web app marketplace and a Chrome app marketplace and so forth, uh, and the coming of HTML5, which hopefully is, I, in my fantasy version of the future of the internet is going to make apps kind of a thing of the past, um, then you don't worry about it. You're like, well, if you don't like the way Apple uh, builds out its um, uh, user experience, uh, then go to Android. Android, by the way, I mean, we talk about Apple a ton, because obviously it's great devices, tons of users. Android is now beating Windows, all Windows, as um, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, the number of units uh, sold. So like, there are more, this year more Android devices will be sold than Windows uh, machines. Um, and so Android is like much more open, it's not controlled, uh, and uh, uh, its existence I think makes me relaxed about kind of the Apple marketplace. But it is the thing to be worried about because if you're an Apple user, um, you know, you're stuck with getting your app, uh, apps from that app store. Um, and uh, uh, those kinds of delays, I think, are really problematic. I would just add that there's an area of app development and distribution that's often not talked about, and that's internal B2B apps. So what we're talking about when it says you know, it takes a long time to get to the app store, that's if you want to have a mass distribution of your app. And there are many companies that depend on that kind of business model, and that's fine. But actually, what I predict is going to happen, that many startups will begin in the next 18, 24 months that don't have that business model that have a business model of going inside very large organizations, be it companies, um, nonprofits, networks of people, unions, so on and so forth, and distribute apps on a private using the Apple Enterprise Server. Apple Enterprise Server allows you to bypass the entire app store. And so you can have 50,000 people, 100,000 people with iPads, iPhones, getting updates, and so on and so forth. And I think the same thing is going to happen on Android as well. I think that just the focus on consumer, consumer, consumer will begin to shift towards a rebalancing of some consumer apps. Yes, 600,000, 800,000, a million. But more and more of these B2B apps that have a huge utility inside companies and don't have to go through the stores to make it happen. Now, just, just to add up our case at phone, in Japan, every iPhone that is sold by SoftBank is sold with a phone era, a phone router. And we have auto connectors for iOS that so when, when our Japanese uh, customers move through Japan, they're constantly going from 3G to Wi-Fi, 3G to Wi-Fi without them realizing because it's, it's seamless. They, they, there's so much phone now. In fact, more than half of the traffic of the iPhone in Japan goes through uh, Wi-Fi and through phone uh, than, than the, the, through the 3G network. But this took a great deal of convincing because Apple doesn't allow anybody to put auto connectors in their devices. And we only got the exception for Japan. And we're struggling to try to get the exception all over the world because we think this is really useful. Apple has been phenomenal for phone because thanks to the iPhone, I mean, we really, I, I mentioned how we took off because of the deployment, but really the demand, the main driver, and that we have to give tremendous credit to Steve Jobs and to Apple for the incredible innovation that the iPhone was. But there's a spirit in Apple, which is super innovative. And there's another sort of, they have sort of, the, 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 there's an, a force that, that, that is there about control. And the control is generally argued for improving the user experience. But the control sometimes makes me, I, I always carry an Android and an iPhone. I have one in each pocket right now. I have a Samsung S3 and I have an iPhone 5. But I... I write on the Androids because there's a keyboard in Androids called SwiftKey that is 
uh, guesses which language I'm writing in. And because I write in different languages, but, uh, but Apple has a globe that you have to hit all the time every time you change the language, which I, I hate. And, and so I wrote to my friends at Apple and say, hey, guys, there's a, a big number of people out there that are not English only, Spanish only, French only. There's a lot of people in the world that live a world of many languages. Why don't you just allow SwiftKey to write? Well, they don't allow SwiftKey. You, they, they don't allow it. There's, SwiftKey is not allowed. And any application that changes the keyboard, every application that changes the Wi-Fi connector, any application that changes a lot of other things are not allowed. And, and that, I, I think, should change. Uh, yeah, and it, let me just say that, that this, this, I mean, the sort of the topic of the panel broadly and this, this discussion, this is the fundamental economic question underlying growth for the United States and for any country. How much do you uh, uh, allow your incumbents to be disrupted by challengers? And there, there's a whole bunch of policies that go into that, but that is the most, to me, that is the most important thing. Uh, uh, countries like Mexico, which have massive monopolists, from whom you have to get permission to do just about anything, don't innovate, and they won't. Um, they can accumulate wealth. They can, you know, make uh, they pay lots of bribes to public officials, uh, make them wealthy too. But the country as a whole is is going to pay a growth tax if they protect their incumbents. And so when I look around Europe right now, and I see the big telecom companies saying not only do we control our pipes? Not only do we get to move into content and move into uh, uh, application stuff, um, but uh, we also want to start taxing Google, like the French have been saying, or we want to start, um, uh, you know, propping up our movie industry, which you know we've gotten used to operating in a certain way with certain kinds of studios, certain kinds of cost structure. The more that you prop up old industries, um, simply because they're uh, the source of employment today the less innovation you'll get, and I believe the less growth that you will have. And this is one of the big questions for the U.S. is, you know, will we allow our telecom companies uh, to be disrupted by new forms of connectivity? I hope so. I love the fact that SoftBank is coming in and buying Sprint. Um, and uh, uh, I look at uh, innovators like Jaztel in Spain or uh, 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 non-incumbents like uh, Free in France trying to innovate the connectivity marketplace. And I think a big question uh, in Latin America, too, is um, you know to what extent will Brazil and Argentina and Chile, Colombia in particular, um, be willing to uh, uh, open up their markets in connectivity, open up their markets in uh, uh, services, open up their markets in applications and so forth, um, in order to allow that next generation of growth fueling, platform friendly, uh, um, um, disruptive entrepreneurs to uh, to succeed. Last question. Hello. My name is Luigi Ribaldi. Well, as you, Martin, I also share the, the passion of writing. I'm an entrepreneur, too. Uh, I try to read a bit because sometimes I don't have much content to, to write, but that's just a joke. That said, also, <laughs> given my past, since I also study in the U.S., I will also share my heart between Europe and the U.S., so it's, uh, yeah, I have two lovers, basically. So uh, the, the, the comment is uh, one of the big issue, difference I've seen between particularly Europe and the U.S. as far as mentality toward entrepreneurship is, is one is the, um, in Europe we stigmatize mistakes much more than in the U.S. So that's, I think it's very important. It's a very important cultural difference. I, I, I wrote an article two weeks ago about that and I said, well, mistakes actually it's a part of the knowledge. It's a part of the process of getting knowledge. There is no, no innovation without mistakes. Edison would have never invented uh, uh, the lamp or nothing like that without mistakes, and that's how it works. In Europe, we, we really what stigma. The question, the question, no, the question, the question, the question is about about that comment, about that whether whether they also feel that this is one of the point. And the well, I yeah no regarding the uh, Andrew hit it right. But I I, th I was impressed by one thing Andrew said that I that I really touched upon. I mentioned about my successes and how proud I am of my successes, but my biggest failure, where I personally lost $50 million, uh, 50 million and my investors around $150 million, was one of the first cloud computing companies in Europe called Einsteinet in Germany. And one of the things that America has, which is what Germany doesn't have and Europe doesn't have, is what I would call entrepreneurial consumers. So it's not only that the companies are entrepreneurial, but the consumers are willing to try something new 
even though they know that there's tremendous risk in trying these, and that the comp you may be sending your photos to a company that may go under and you may never get your pictures back. You may be getting your music from a company that will never give you your music back. You may be paying a ton of money to some cloud company that has uh, a, a drive in the, in the uh, and, and like Dropbox that came out of nowhere and now it's worth billions and we're giving all this information to Dropbox. There was obviously tremendous trust that Dropbox was going to make it when we decided to give all this information to so the concept of failure in, is not just as, a, as an entrepreneur, it's the consumers in America, and more and more in Europe, but basically mainly in America, that are unwilling to take risks and put vital parts of their life in startups, right? And then regarding failure, which as you know, I, 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 if you think about it, the vast majority of startups fail, the, it's true what you said about the stigma. Um, I, 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 I say sometimes, well, in business, sometimes I make money and sometimes I learn, right? And, and, I, and I think that there's a, a big learning element of failure. Having said this, I don't think Americans celebrate failure, which I heard that a lot. I don't think they're happy, hey, we failed. Uh, they, <laughs> like, uh, they don't celebrate failure, and that's a confusion. They see failure as a sad, Difficult moment, but a learning experience to move on and build something else, which hopefully next time will work. I, I think this is actually one of the best reasons to be really optimistic about Latin America over the long term, even more so than, than Europe and its entrepreneurial culture. So when I was at Google, I spent a lot of time talking to the press. And one of the things that always struck me was, anytime Google launched something new, the American press would be like, woo, like let's, you know, like basically like let's repeat your propaganda as our news story. You know, it's like they just loved the new stuff. And when I would talk to European journalists, they were always uh, negative, right? So always, their, their whole point was like how risky it's going to be for privacy, how poorly we've thought out security, how disrespectful of local uh, culture we are, all of these. And so their press reports were just all of that kind of, all true, by the way, but like, you know, all, <laughs> all, but like all super, you know, negative, right? And, and anyway, in Latin America, um, uh, the Brazilian press in particular um, is much more like the American press, which is a culturally celebrates the new thing, wants to love it, wants to be um, on the cutting edge, and, um, and uh, uh, totally forgiving of failure. You know, the British press in particular could not be more gleeful than when someone fails. They love it. <laughs> they just jump all over it. But in Brazil, a little bit less so in Argentina, which I think is a little bit more like the UK in some ways in, uh, uh, in, in, in that part of its culture. Um, but in Latin America in general, you have much more kind of youthful energy and a culture that I think is um, new world culture. And I think that's something that should be really um, uh, uh, embraced by uh, Latin American entrepreneurs, which is um, to um, uh, uh, take advantage of that kind of cultural openness and friendliness to the new. I would say two things. First, if you look at a case study in America, there's a guy who's on TV successful raising money now, despite the fact that he ran his business into the ground and went bankrupt twice, which is Donald Trump. Um, so, so number one, you have, you have some cases like that. But more seriously, I think part of what happens in America is that when a company starts up, and let's say it's going to fail, um, other people see value in those assets. So yes, it wasn't a great s a success. It wasn't going to be a 10x or 100x return for the investors and for the entrepreneur. But what they can do in the U.S. quite easily is hook up with some other entities that might be out there, either large companies, medium-sized companies, sometimes a company just their size, and merge in together, obviously not get a huge return, but be part of something and actually still make it happen. So there's many, many examples of that. And so it wasn't so much that it was complete failure or complete success. We allow for this kind of um, recycling of technology and ideas so that it quickly gets back into the ecosystem instead of being left on the side like roadkill. Well, like I said, I like to surround myself with people who I admire. Jack, <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. <laughs>